Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for all turning out. This is a nice... You can see I'm squinting into the dimness. The only notes I have, I just want to get my fellow panelists. We've been talking a lot in the last couple of days about this. We come at this from interconnected but different perspectives. I'm the chief curator and decorative arts curator, and I fell into jewelry as part of that job uh, at the Newark Museum, which I'm assuming everybody in the room has heard of, but I won't look to see. Uh, <laughs> on my left are my fellow panelists, Beth Weiss from the Metropolitan Museum from the American Wing, Freya Hartzell, uh, who is my new best friend, who is, uh, who, uh, is a professor of design history uh, at the Bard Graduate Center, uh, Navina Haidar, uh, who is in the Islamic Department at the Metropolitan Museum, and Jonathan Wall, who is among us the maker, uh, an artist and a teacher. And in fact, one thing we came across yesterday in our conversation, we're all teachers. Uh, we just teach in different ways about different things. And so I'll put my little notes away now and find the terrifyingly small thing. I don't even know where I point it. Uh, we each have a couple of images, or I guess I have a couple, everybody else has one. Uh, because being a curator, I use my images as a crutch. But we all discovered that we love jewelry and we think about jewelry in different ways. And the whole idea of surface and substance uh, fascinated us and we could be here for several hours. Uh, and blessed be, we won't. Uh, but I just, we each wanted to show an image. So I, I wanted to show two things from the Newark Museum collection, both of which I have acquired recently for our jewelry collection, which is part of the decorative arts collection. I link it to metal smithing. Uh, this is, is an 18th century Portuguese Parisian style necklace, very recently acquired, uh, made in Lisbon, but set with Brazilian topaz. There are any number of reasons I wanted this for the collection, but uh, the, the surface Part of it is that this was the benchmark of aristocratic jewelry design uh, in the 18th century, courtly jewelry, uh, and the fact that it's set with topaz is more about aspiration and rising bourgeoisie than it is about aristocracy, but it's also the grandmother of every blingy piece of pretentious jewelry you can buy on earth today. It is the avatar of everything that comes after. And then, on the substance side of it is a, uh, a rather splendid necklace by a young Danish artist named Annette Dam, uh, produced in the 21st century, called the 84 and a half carat necklace. And what it is is poking fun at that very avatar, the idea of it's not jewelry, it's geology. Uh, and the gem, the necklaces with the big rocks. And so this is a necklace made of a cultured pearls and white coral with semi-precious stones in their original rock hound boxes with beautifully handcrafted minimalist uh, silver mounts, all of it cascading. It's quite a large scale necklace and challenges the functionality of jewelry, but it shows this kind of content, this sort of cultural awareness that is both modern and hip and young and ironic, all of which seems to be very much about the world today and young people in general. So with that, I'll pass it on to Beth. That was quick, Ulysses. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the power of jewelry beyond just adornment. When I was a little girl, I had a gold bangle bracelet that was engraved with my name, Beth. And that bracelet was so special to me. And of course, I wouldn't have wondered why at the time. I think it made me feel grown up. It made me feel special. I liked how it looked and felt. Maybe it even made me feel safe. We could talk about bondage and jewelry. <laughs> but I think it was the first time I actually realized that there was, a, there was power in a piece of jewelry beyond just how pretty it was. Now, I came, uh, I was trained as an art historian, so I tend to look at all objects first from a design point of view. What are the materials? How is it made? Uh, but I came to studying jewelry through my work, scholarly work, on English and American silver. And uh, I'm sure most of you know that jewelers and silversmiths, goldsmiths, are essentially the same profession. I mean, it's the same techniques, the same, a lot of the same tools. And if you look at 18th, 19th century trade cards or newspaper advertisements, goldsmith and jeweler is a, a very commonplace phrase. Uh, they, there's also another aspect about both of them. When I lecture about silver, I love to point out that silver is the one art form that is routinely personalized with a coat of arms or a crest, with a, a 
an interlaced monogram with an inscription, a dedication inscription, telling to whom it was given, for what purpose, perhaps. It opens the doors to research on, on collections. And I think jewelry maybe isn't as often uh, inscribed, although it can be. Check your, the inside of your wedding band. But I think it has that same very intimate, very personal connection that you don't necessarily get from a painting or a piece of sculpture. Why do we wear jewelry? What are you wearing today? You know, it's, it's uh, to make a statement, to um, look nice, to accessorize with what you're wearing. But there's another aspect to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, is a, it can be a private keepsake, some special message. And I, <clears throat> I'd just like to tell you a, a brief story about it. I was speaking with a man, a uh, professional, who uh, was asking me about this exhibition. And I said I was very interested in memory as it, as it relates to jewelry. And without skipping a beat, he reached under his collar, which was held in place with a necktie, and he pulled out a gold mounted, a, a coin mounted in gold on a chain. And he stuck it back in and he said, my sister made this for me and I wear it every day. So he appreciated on some deep level this power that jewelry has beyond adornment. What we're wearing today might be something we've inherited, something that we purchased on a special trip, a birthday present, a, an anniversary gift, or something we maybe even just bought for ourselves. But each of those has a memory attached to it. And uh, there's a, a genre of jewelry, I'm sure most of you know, called mourning jewelry. It was particularly popular in the 17th or the 19th centuries. And a lot of mourning jewelry has within it either a lock or a plate of human hair. Now, this might seem creepy to us today. I don't tend to wear mourning jewelry, do you? <laughs> but it, um, you know, it had that special, intimate, personal, long-lived relationship to the past, to a loved one or to um, someone deceased. And mourning jewelry is related, in, uh, not related, but on a similar vein are pieces of jewelry that have uh, power, uh, magical power, talismanic power. You know, today, I mean, it, it goes back to antiquity, but today I think some of us have good luck charms that we like to wear, you know, what you wear when you need a little boost. Another topic I'd like to mention is identity. Through jewelry, we identify ourselves to the world. You know, it can be on a personal level, it can be on an institutional level, a community level. Uh, if you're dripping in diamonds, it tells the world that you've got status, that you've got wealth. And uh, maybe, maybe it's even a royal obligation. There's a wonderful um, quotation from Horace Walpole who, sa who said that George III would not let Queen Charlotte be seen in public without her diamonds, which he had given her and which were prodigious, but that was part of her identity. You know, I don't have anything like that, but you know, I, the, a badge of membership, let's say, uh, be it a World Series ring, a uh, Girl Scouts of America badge, an American flag, or a pink ribbon. You know, all of these announce something about who we are. And then the third um, topic that I wanted to mention is provocation. And for this, I'd like my slide, <laughs> my one slide. Um, you know, sometimes we wear jewelry to provoke to really make a statement. A lot of cont modern contemporary jewelers use unexpected materials or scale or imbue their jewelry with sexual innuendo, something that will bring uh, you know, comments, uh, questions, conversation to light. And I'm showing you here uh, a necklace in the Mets collection by Elsa Schiaparelli, or designed by her for the fall 1938 um, uh, uh, fashion show, and it is made of a new kind of plastic called rhodoid that you can see is just a, an invisible strip onto which she has attached, uh, I think it's about 20 very colorful metal insects so that they look like they're crawling on the wearer's skin. It's pretty creepy, and I'm not sure I'd want to wear it, but there is something also about it because it's so colorful and joyful and they look like little metal toys, that it's amusing as well, and it certainly provokes conversation. I'd just like to end with a quote um, that I found in a wonderful book, if you haven't come across it, by Marcia Poynton, called Brilliant Effects, A Cultural History of Gemstones and Jewelry. And she quotes from a, le a letter from Elizabeth Montague, who was one of the, the sort of the queen of the blue stockings, uh, writing in 1767 to Lord Kames, who was a Scottish judge and philosopher. And here's what she said. 
Jewels seem most noble, appropriated to some purpose, parentheses, because there is a, there is, sorry, because there is a littleness of mind in ostentatious parade. I'll leave you with that, <laughs> thank you. As the um, academic on the stool, I am going, that's a terrible thing to say. Um, I'm going to actually read a little bit, sort of representing my, my line of work. So I'm a historian of design, as Ulysses mentioned. Um, and I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to kind of give an example of some of the things that, that Beth has just been talking about. Really how we can find meaning in jewelry or how these ideas of surface and substance can come together and really tell a story. Um, so what we're looking at here is, as it says on the screen, an example of Berlin ironwork jewelry. Um, now, you'll notice right away that it lacks actually most of what makes the jewelry at this fair so stunning. It's not shiny, it's not sparkly, it isn't crammed with huge luminous gemstones or actually any stones at all. Um, and yet, I completely love it. Um, and now I'll admit that I'm speaking as somebody who named her daughter after the Icelandic word for chain mail, so I could be a little bit biased. But whenever I see a piece of Berlin ironwork, it really just takes my breath away. Um, so right away, this kind of jewelry has meaning for me on a personal level, which I've just spoken about. It's not flashy, it's not precious in terms of its materials. But this base material of iron, something that we might associate with public architecture or heavy industry or these chandeliers that are right above us here, um, worked in this incredibly delicate, meticulous way is a combination that I find just thrilling. Um, not to mention that many of these iron pieces are actually feather light. And when you hold them in your hand, it's, it's disorienting. You, you expect something heavy and what you encounter is just something delicate and light, um, kind of like an insect. I was just reminded of that. The insect necklace made me think of this a little bit. And some of these necklaces and pieces of jewelry did include um, butterflies, um, insects, this kind of relation to nature, leaves, things that seem ephemeral. So as a historian of design, what's really interesting to me is how an intimate sense of something like this can come together with its history to give us not just an intellectual understanding of what Berlin ironwork was, but also kind of a felt sense of its time. So it gives you a, a texture of this moment in history when you know something about this, but you also have a, 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 a tactile, kind of intimate feeling about it. So bracelets, earrings, and necklaces like this one were first produced in Prussia during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s. So this is a slightly later example, which I didn't know yesterday when I picked it, but, but there it is, I've been, I've been found out. Um, so in support of Prussia's resistance to Napoleon, Prussian women donated their gold jewelry to the war effort. And in place of their gold, they wore jewelry made from one of Prussia's natural resources, which is iron. So some of their Berlin ironwork jewelry even made this explicit with the words, I gave gold for iron, actually included in the design of the jewelry. So this is surface and substance really acting together. Um, though, as I keep saying, it's not shiny, sparkly, or mesmerizing like a gem. Mm. It has an intricacy and a delicacy that appeal to our senses in a different way. You want to pick it up. You want to explore it with the tips of your fingers. You want to put it on. But it was, at the same time, a wearable emblem of resistance, a political statement piece. It's tough, yet intricate, a lot like chain mail, which I suppose is why I like it. Um, but there's a twist at the end of my story, and I am coming to the end of my story. And I think it's a twist that really speaks to this kind of dual nature of jewelry, which I think is really what this panel is all about. As both surface and substance, power and adornment, um, at the same time, or maybe at different times, which is something a little subtler, I think, and maybe interesting, that, that it can shift from surface to substance and back again. Um, so although Berlin ironwork is born with a very specific cultural pedigree as a Prussian symbol of power and resistance against a detested French aggressor, it soon becomes fashionable. So fashionable, in fact, that by the 1830s and 40s, it's being made and worn in France, the very place that it was designed to, to hate, right, to defy. Um, and it can actually be quite difficult to tell Prussian ironwork from French ironwork. Um, and 
when I look at this piece, somebody may know, again, I'm, I, I defer to those who are experts, but I don't know, I don't know where this piece comes from. Um, so iron was strong, but fashion was stronger. And that's, a, that's another, I think, this question of fashion, strength of fashion, what this means for jewelry is, is a really interesting piece of this relation of the surface of something and the substance of its meaning. So there's an irony here, right? And maybe also a paradox, and academics love both of those things, so I'm going for that immediately. So what started out as substance turned pretty quickly into surface, or maybe not. Maybe the real paradox of all jewelry is that we can't separate the two. So that's my little shtick. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a curator in Islamic art, and um, I have a special interest in the art of the sub Indian subcontinent. But if you think of Islam as a huge tradition that spread over 14 centuries across the world, I bear the burden today of representing about 32 modern nations, uh, five uh, major language groups, uh, many, many styles of art and, and jeweled uh, traditions. Um, and a kind of interface between this geographical variety and streams of history that have uh, developed in regions, which met with the expanding traditions of Islam, which unified these parts of the world, various parts of the world, and really from Spain to India by the early 8th century. So um, onward from there, we are talking about a very complex phenomenon. And when you think about the jewel dots, uh, I've chosen to show one piece from, from India, because um, it's, it's very easy to settle on the Mughal period, which um, from the 17th century was one of the most jewelry mad um, and lavish periods of the jeweled arts anywhere in the Muslim world, anywhere in the world, um, and, and very much so in terms of Indian history as well. But what I thought I would talk about today is, firstly, uh, show you a type of object that we may not normally think about in, in the Western world, which is, uh, jewelry for, ma for men, and in fact, I can tell you that the men were more lavishly ornamented um, quite often in the, in, in the uh, Mughal tradition than, than women. And this interesting piece also tells you about the meeting of East and West in some sense, because it's a, uh, it's a piece that was made in the uh, late 19th century, uh, and then uh, refashioned with a clip that was added on by Cartier. It's, it's something that is a, a very useful, um, item of jewelry if you're a Maharaja, because what you can do is <laughs> you, can, you can wear it as it exists and on that slide on your turban, and it becomes a full-fledged turban ornament of a very uh, sort of stylized into a sort of modern style, but based on kind of older styles. Um, it also separates into two pieces, so you can wear a smaller turban ornament on, on this, the, the diamond with the feather can be worn on the turban, and then the rest of it, the horizontal band, can actually be strapped onto your upper arm in a traditional style of jewelry known as a bazu band, as a sort of arm band. Um, and this, by the way, is just one item of many, many, many lavish jewels that would have been worn together across, over the entire body. So we're talking about extreme glamour, extreme... Um, sort of relation, uh, sort of dynamic relationship between different types of jeweled items on a single body, and uh, and a kind of historical trajectory that has given shape and form to each of these items. So, for example, the idea of the aigrette, you know, the um, the, the feather part of it, um, is in some ways related to European hat aigrettes that became known in the Mughal court in the 17th century. But going back in in non-Western tradition, you also have the tradition of putting owl feathers in your turban if you're a Mongol from whom the Mughals were descended. So there is a kind of historicizing element that made sense to the Mughals themselves. And finally, there is a, an engagement with nature because these forms, that entire plume form that you see on top is essentially based um, on a feather form as you can see. And <clears throat> but it's not very literally realized. I mean, for fancy effect, the present owner put that sort of white uh, feather in there. But we may not have had that kind of a feather necessarily traditionally. But the shape itself of the jeweled bit itself is, is already in the shape of a plume. And that really brings you to one of the fundamental approaches of Islamic art, wherever it takes place, wherever it sort of expresses itself, or however you define it, towards nature. And that is to engage with nature by stylizing it, not really um, 
literally imitating it or being terribly naturalistic, even at its most naturalistic moment, which is in fact in the Mughal period, you find that nature is essentially stylized. It is um, shaped in a way that is slightly abstracted from reality. And this is a very interesting and original development in, in the world of Islamic design and architecture and, and textile design and, and jewelry design. Um, a kind of almost um, sort of looking at the world through a very particular lens, which is rather one degree removed from reality, but, but based in the truth of nature. So I, I think that's a sort of guiding principle, if you like, that joins all these types of places and traditions together. I'll, I'll just very quickly end by saying um, that uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that I, I'm very literary because uh, the, whole, the great tradition of Islam is really a, a tradition of literature and uh, sets of ideas that come out of the world of poetry and, and, and writing, history and so on. And so it's very interesting to me when I see that the jeweled arts in some sense expand our a metaphorical range. Um, and quite often the most important things that matter to a human being and are expressed in literature, love, relationships, power, etc., are quite often expressed in metaphors that relate to the jeweled arts. And that's something that I thought I would just mention as a kind of great feature of Islamic, uh, the Islamic jeweled arts. Thank you so much. And I pass over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna try and uh, couch what I want to say with the idea of surface and substance and work from substance to surface. Um, I'm showing a piece from Otto Kunzli. I was trained um, in, as a jeweler in the 80s and we were trained, most jewelers today are trained in art schools. So we are trained to make art. We are trained to make art within a postmodern context. So most schools um, that academic jewelers go to or uh, um, were founded after the war, so in a very modernist sensibility. Um, ornamentation was really frowned upon. And because we were in art school, we kind of had to make art. So the idea, of, the idea of the idea being preeminent and the object not being important was something and is something that is um, often on my mind, certainly part of my training and my upbringing. Um, it's, it has been, um, I think at times, a frustrating place for jewelry to exist in because personally, um, it's not always, I think, the best format for an idea. I really do love a great piece of jewelry. I love a piece of adornment. I love to feel good in jewelry, and I don't always necessarily need to make a statement about whatever I'm doing. It subtly makes a statement, I think, on its own. Um, but the piece I'm showing, I think, is one of, it's one of my favorite pieces of what one would call art jewelry or studio jewelry. It's by Otto Kunzli, who is the head of the Academy in Munich, which is one of the most important schools for contemporary jewelers. And it is a necklace made out of 48 wedding rings that he bought um, at pawn shops around Munich. And I think what is so memorable for me and why I want to show this piece is because it, it, it knits together these two ideas of an art object and a real object. And so perfectly in a way that embodies both of them. He's using real pieces of jewelry that exist in this very normal, very everyday way, these wedding rings, which are imbued with memory. Um, and in this case, loss or failure, because he bought these rings in pawn shops. And he has transformed those objects into something other, with just themselves. Um, I think it's an astounding piece of contemporary art jewelry, one of the most successful pieces, um, because it's both of those things. It takes one thing and creates another. Um, I'm not a fan of some of his other jewelry, to be all, all, in all honesty, sorry, Otto, but this piece in particular. Um, and, you know, what I find interesting now, being a maker, an educator, um, a drawer, um, drawings of jewelry that were inspired by making jewelry, which we can talk off camera about, <laughs> is that being trained in art school in the 80s um, and this idea of content being preeminent, um, we weren't trained very much in the specifics of jewelry making per se. 
And for me, what I find so seductive and where the substance I find very often today in jewelry is the mastery of the surface does become the substance for me. This incredible object, the, the ability of people to make, um, the ability of a wax carver to carve a wax to a millimeter, uh, an engraver who knows how to sharpen a graver. You know, in this, in this 21st century world, we are so um, inundated with things, objects, images. Uh, uh, I can't even keep track of my Instagram feed. I, I post, but I don't follow because I just can't handle it. Um, you know, the, the, the ability of a person to sit down and learn a trade that's, you know, or a skill that's methodical and takes attention and takes time, I still find really romantic and really beautiful and incredibly seductive. Um, so I would like to think that I perhaps was trained as a substance maker, and now I'm seduced as a surface maker. Um, and it's fascinating to be part of this panel, and thank you for the invitation, because we all come at it from all these different angles. And um, I was saying that although this is a paradox, surface and substance, and certainly it's a conversation that happens within my field, being trained as an academic jeweler very, very often, I love the fact that there is contradiction or a paradox. It makes the field really exciting, and there's fashion jewelry, and there's art jewelry, and there's studio jewelry, and there's every kind of jewelry, all kinds of jewelry. And as I see the art world being consumed more and more by the internet and everything, and ceramics, and blah, 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 I love the fact that there is perhaps this idiosyncratic place called jewelry that's hard to define and crosses all these lines of memory and tradition and ritual and making. Um, it's a really fascinating place to be and certainly inspires me as an artist um, in a very specific and particular way. Just imagine, if you will, all memory. of those slides. Memory, yeah. Keep thinking about so, memory. Uh, so what we're, what we're theoretically going to do now is chit-chat, or as we were instructed, <laughs> to have the most f memorable dinner party conversation you've ever heard right. uh, amongst us, and then, and then take some conversation. And what, what you said, I was enthralled by this when, when uh, Jonathan sent it out, and I, I covet this for my museum desperately because it, it's both. And I can also, as I said, I could see Nancy Reagan wearing that with an Adolfo suit in the mid-1980s. It's absolutely, it is a 1980s big gold necklace, and yet it is this powerful thing, this talisman of ended marriage, and that sort of, because the wedding ring is perhaps the most boring and the most fraught object uh, in, uh, in, we have a lot of wedding rings from 19th and 18th century New Jersey in the Newark Museum collection. And I've only ever shown one because they're incredibly boring. Because I have, there's an 18th century wedding ring that is inside a 19th century wedding ring that has a little lid. So you can open it and pop the 18th century ring out. And clearly that's about keeping an ancestress close. Uh, of course, the person who died and left them all to us, it's all from one family collection. Couldn't have cared less about any of it and left us no history on any of them. This is the only one we can guess. Uh, but to speak, and I thought, to speak to both of, something of everything we've said, I, I am obsessed with Facebook and Instagram. Uh, uh, and <laughs> Facebook is hopelessly for old people, as my daughter tells me, and Instagram is a sl slight bit hipper, but it's not Snapchat, and I don't even want to go there. But I, I put up on, on Facebook, uh, as I was thinking about this, I found a great picture of a 1960s Harry Winston holly wreath, diamond necklace. And I posted it and I said, okay, is this art or is this jewelry? Would a museum want this? Of course I would want it, I covet everything. <laughs> but I, I figured I could make a rationale for art simply because I wanted it. And a curator, curators are very adept at that. Uh, but I'm that, and I was fascinated. I got about 150 responses, some of them insulting, and some of them saying, oh, it's totally art. And, and I was completely fascinated because, as you said, it's not something that we're ever gonna resolve. Yeah, and um, I, as I said earlier, my, my mother has an incredible diamond-studded amethyst set that my grandfather worked in Southeast Asia, brought back for her and all my sisters. I have a watch. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even wearing that watch. Um, anyway, you know, where, where are you going to wear that? I said to my mom, I'm like, what coronation are you going to? Where, where are you going to wear that? The Acme? 
Um, which, so in a way, those objects become art objects because they are so almost removed from every day. Then they become this thing, this idea of an idea. So we, we get into it being maybe an art object because it's so fantastic and so over the top and so almost not wearable because where, where, yeah, I don't, you know, what premiere, what coronation, it's kind of fascinating. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Harry Winston because something I think about very often is in our digital age, you know, CAD, Rhino, digital printing, where does that leave us? One of our CAD teachers um, works for Harry Winston. And I said, do you do everything in CAD now? And he said, oh no, we can never. I'm like, why not? He's like, it would be dead. The object would, it would, the thing would look dead. Mm. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, it doesn't have the same hand. He's like, we will make components in CAD and we will fabricate components and we will combine them, but we would never ever make one thing in CAD. So as from a maker's point of view, in terms of the contemporary jewelry world, it, it did give me a lot of hope because it's one of those challenges that we're looking at. And as curators, I would be curious to say someday, you know, would, will you guys collect stuff that's not made by hand? You know, I think this actually, <laughs> what, what first occurred to me when you mentioned that is what happened with the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. You know, Birmingham, little bits of jewelry being, or I suppose you could say that for, for um, ironwork. And the backlash of the arts and crafts movement was getting back to, to the making. Um, you know, there are beautiful things mass produced, but they don't have the same heart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is the question. I mean, two things that came out of what, what you said, and also, Lucy, your, your, your question, your comment, this, this last one. One is this idea that's really interesting to me of function, right? And especially when I look at that piece and, you know, you think about, you know, Nancy Reagan being able to wear it. This is a, it's a heavy piece. I mean, psychologically, right? I mean, thinking about wearing this, what does it mean to wear this, to actually make it functional? What, what you know, um, and this idea of memory is, is so present. Um, and that's a question to me that there is this, I mean, built into jewelry is this idea of function. We can take it out of that space, but you're, you know, immediately when you see something that's a necklace, you think I could put that on or not, right? And so there's this funny halfway house of kind of where that falls. And I think the other question that's really interesting to me is this question of the object. I mean, what you talk about in, you know, being in art school in the 80s and the concept, I mean, that's, I've, I've heard that for many people who have been in art school in the 80s and, and after. Yeah. Um, and I, it feels like uh, jewelry kind of um, trumps that in a way, right? Because it, it is, there's an objectness. But it, it feels as though jewelry, even if it is taken out of that space of wearing, right? It still has this objectness, it has this presence. And, and this, this, I mean, I think it's fascinating the question of how it's designed, right? That if it's designed, without that sense of like the object presence in the work, that it loses something. Um, and I wonder about that sense of like, you know, these are wedding rings that had a life. They, they're things, they came from somewhere and they've become something else, but they have that kind of object presence and that's something that's really interesting. I don't know if you've all experienced Well, you know, that. I was just thinking it's, um, it's almost morning jewelry gone wild. You right? know, I'm just sitting here thinking that it looks like death's necklace. Like death would wear this necklace, like dead. <laughs> Like this whole long necklace of like dead people's wedding rings. Sorry. Speaking Halloween, of, right? Speaking this of morning jewelry, yes, happy Halloween. Iron jewelry too. It's good for Halloween. So Navina, because you talked yesterday about you, you made this amazing statement about sort of the the, the sweep of time and how you know. Whereas as a, as curators, we obsess about the thing that looks like right now, and and of course that's one of the things that appeals because it's very 80s. But you reminded us that the same things crop up again and again and again and again over 2,000 years of jewelry. And, and not to pin this on you, but could you speak to that? Because I thought that was really fascinating. Well, if you look at jewelry over a long period of time, you tend to, I mean, approach it in different ways. But basically, with the, you, know, you go by dynasty or period, or you have a sort of periodization for jewelry that links up to some larger trend in history. So it could be the patronage, as I said, of a particular court or dynasty, etc. Having said that, you then find you're befuddled, because quite often the jewelry doesn't 
behave in a nice docile way, matching itself up to every ruler who comes and goes and so on. It has its own chronology. It has its own chronology. And quite often you find that for some reason it might revive a design that goes, uh, that's been extinct in the region for a thousand years and suddenly you find it pops back and you don't know why and when. And that, that I find really fascinating. Um, I mean, ancient Greek designs, for example, keep popping up through history, and uh, I'm never sure exactly why they come up and in what circumstances, but you find them in the middle of Iraq or in the, in the, in the 10th century or, some, or Iran in the 17th century. You might find something that resembles something very, very ancient. Um, and we've never really, you know, contextualized that. So I think that's, that's one of the things that uh, is interesting to me. Um, another thing that we were talking about yesterday is the strange mystery of how things absolutely don't survive as well, because in the case of Indian art in general, there's a massive, uh, you know, there, well, there's a great mystery about finding anything before the 15th century that can be reliably, <clears throat> that's not a temple statue, that's made of metal, that's not a temple statue, those have survived in great numbers, but almost every other kind of object, metalwork object, jeweled object, Anything else is very, very hard to confidently say um, that this is 14th century, 13th century, 12th century, 10th century, whereas you look at the Middle East, you find that there's a much better history of preservation. And the question is why, what are the particular social practices or the material, the, the relationship with material, the reuse of material, etc., that lead to the survival of some traditions and the complete extinction of others? But I'd also just like to add that um, one of the big differences I find when I'm looking globally at jewelry is that here in the West, I mean, I say here in the West as a sort of invading marauder from elsewhere, but I, I basically, um, in, in the West, you, you have this idea of a singular piece of jewelry, like a single necklace that is one individual artist's design. He's recognized as an individual. It's a unique thing, whereas, um, in the, in, by and large in the non-Western world, you have much more of a reproductive tradition. I mean, it's the same form, slightly altered, and you don't know who's done them. It, it was some particular individual's idea to do it this way rather than that, but essentially it's an established form that is repeating itself. And the thing that makes the jeweled piece special is not the form or the design, it is actually the gemstone quite often, the absolute centerpiece of that that particular design that is the reason why the, the design exists. It exists to present the gemstone. And, and so the whole culture of gemstones, the value given to gemstones, the talismanic, the traditional, the, the culture, the trade, the, the relationships, the, the murders and the, <laughs> and the, the you know, over the Kohinoor or the, you know, whatever it might be, is, is, is a kind of missing, I mean, it's a sort of contrasting element, I would say, with the West. I don't find that the West is as obsessed with the singular gemstone in the way that you have had in the non-Western world. It, it doesn't give that kind of meaning and importance, especially talismanic, um, you know, to, to gemstones or semi-precious stones. You guys had better gems. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, yeah. And bigger ones. <laughs> you know, you know the thing is that actually, they, they, you won't believe how far they had to go to get the gems. Yeah. They had to go all the way to South America to get uh, uh, emeralds from Colombia, and they had to go all the way to, um, you know, gold was internationally traded from ancient times. But you know, it was they, lots of efforts were made, and now today you have a problem with the manufacture of fake gems. Um, the, the making of new gems, which are made to look old. I mean, this is a big, big problem. And uh, so as a curator, I often wonder, in fact, um, my colleague and I, who's um, in, happily in the audience today, were actually looking at a necklace the other day and wondering whether those incredible diamonds were 20th century African diamonds or 17th century Golconda diamonds. It's very, very hard to say. Can I say one quick romantic thing about gems? It's one of the things about jewelry that I love. Um, is that, and we talked about this the other day, that, you know, I, I think gems are metaphors for eyes. You know, eyes are the shiniest part of our bodies, and it's where we connect most deeply with another person. They're refractive and reflective, you can see through them, and to me that's what a gem is, and it makes, it's, there's no doubt that that's why we give one of the most rarefied gems to our beloved when we tell them how much we love them. Because in a way, it's a metaphor for that eye and that level, I think, that level of connection, that deep level of I'm looking through you, into you, you're everything. So I'm giving myself goosebumps. Well, that's, no, that's, that's great. 
And I realize what we're all doing is we're telling stories we told each other earlier. Now, I'm going to tell a story that you didn't hear, and I'm going to bring up a topic that is, we sort of decided not to talk about <laughs> as, as sort of a, a final thing before. But, but it also has to do with the idea of, of jewelry as art, and that uh, Freya and I talked about this. Um, is that the idea, at what point that, so that necklace by the young Danish woman, uh, at what point does a, a jewel that you wear, or the sarpesh, does it cease to be just an adornment and, or just an identifier of who you are, but becomes, does it ever cease being adornment and become simply, I am wearing a work of art? Uh, and I think we sort of decided not, but, but the idea of the transfer of, uh, of an adornment to art is something I experienced physically on the phone at an auction. And it's, and it's, one, of the, it's one of the darkest points of my life as a curator collecting jewelry. I was on the phone with an auction house trying to get a piece of uh, Alexander Calder jewelry, a great big initial pin from 1943, made for a woman whose career started at the Newark Museum. And I had been, and this was the moment in the 90s when suddenly Calder jewelry ceased to be something that idiot craft people collected for <laughs> modest amounts. I mean, I was, I was literally on the phone when the market changed, and I had been told, what? No, I didn't change it. It's the, well, I will tell you, I, I won't name names. I will point fingers, however. Uh, <laughs> But so it was this great big initial pin, and I had been authorized by the trustees to go three times the high estimate, up to $20,000. And I was bidding on the phone at auction, and I dropped out at 40, without authorization, mind you. So if I'd won, I would have been sort of in trouble. And, and then the person who won came up to me at a party at the Met, gloating that she had beat me. And it's now in your collection, actually. <laughs> But I had to, that's going in my memoirs too. But, but it was that moment when suddenly the art world looked at Alexander Calder jewelry and said, holy moly, this is sculpture. This isn't just jewelry for those people, you know, those hippie people who wear beat up arty jewelry. This is art. But he was a sculptor and this is one of those paradoxes. Artists can make jewelry, but it's very dangerous for jewelers to make art. Right. And yet, and yet, he you was do a, both. I mean, that's the thing is that we could debate, but I eventually did buy a piece of Calder, but his stuff is both art and jewelry because he meant it to be worn, and he never, well, except once in his life, he never intended it to be sold. It was all mostly made for friends. He did one show in 1940. Uh, but, so, but I think, but so that, that borderline, and I sniffed at Calder, obviously, for too long. Oh, he's an artist dabbling. But then I realized, oh, no, he actually makes the jewelry, and he loves it. Uh, and so... Sorry, I missed that boat. <laughs> I like to make her guilty. <laughs> so, does, the, does everybody feel satisfied? Should we ask the audience to let, let have at us? Anybody have comments, questions, slings and arrows? <laughs> Uh, I was the, just that, curious. That pin sold at auction for fifty thousand. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's fifteen years ago. That was the beginning of that change. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Ulysses. Hi, Lee. W when would <laughs> when would you say when does uh, jewelry, as a decorative art, when does it become art? You know, he had a he had an interesting point. Calder was an artist. Maybe he wasn't intentionally uh, doing his jewelry for art. I think he was doing it just because he was doing it and not to sell. But when does other types of jewelry become art? Or as design, maybe when I see some design shows in furniture. When furniture becomes regarded as art versus form following yeah. function, then it kind of enters the art world and things change. Where does that intersection or where does that start stop does anyone well, on the panel I, have an opinion and, and I'll, I'll i'll answer that question in a classically arrogant curatorial way because there are very few curators in this country who deal with jewelry very few and basically jewelry becomes art 
Unlike in a lot of other collecting areas, but jewelry becomes art when a museum curator says it's art. And then when, uh, and, and that's not fair, but I think that's, because there are a lot of museum curators who will not deal with jewelry at all, except as historical artifact, cultural artifact. Uh, but basically, and as I pointed this out yesterday, we have a, somewhere in the world is a urinal with a signature on it. Uh, and that was an artist saying, this is art because I say so. Uh, and so I think a, a, someone who makes jewelry uh, can say it's art or not. And my, my feeling about that is jewelry is art when it speaks to me as art. But as a decorative arts curator, I don't care. And I'm always saying this to craftspeople who come to me and say, am I an artist? And I'm saying, I don't know, are you an artist? I'm a decorative arts curator, I don't do art. Uh, I, do, I do things, I do household objects and jewelry that people wear. But of course, I have my own biases. So I think, I think each of us would say, something slightly different about when jewelry becomes art, because I think it becomes, becomes art for each of us when we think it is. Yeah, absolutely, I think it's a really subjective decision. You know, what do you consider art? To, to your point, I mean, the urinal that just blew the lid off art, and then maybe down to the Brillo boxes, we get a little finer. Um, so it really, you know, who's deciding if it's art? What curator, what person, what culture, I, you know, I. And the motivation behind that, right? Why, why, why does it need to be or not need to be art, and what's what's driving that? And I think right. that's that's can, that's a question that can be answered really cynically, right? Or it can be answered from your personal perch. <laughs> but um, I mean, for me, as I was bringing up before, one of the big questions is function, right? That if it's something that ceases to function as something one can wear, that's that's a that's a I don't even necessarily want to assign art, non-art categories to that, but it's still an interesting kind of part of that. Yeah, because of there is a littleness of mind in ostentatious right. parade. <laughs> <laughs> and we I don't think with... something that just doesn't work yeah. as a piece of jewelry makes it art either. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's also the value issue, which we studiously right. avoided, right. Uh, because how do you put value? You know, if it's, yeah, exactly <laughs> until now. Is it the materials? Right. right. Certainly. Uh, design? Is it a, a name that has become synonymous with the best or a fad? You know, it's, it's really tough to judge that. But uh, this sort of brings us a little bit to the idea, to the kind of claiming of two words, which I think have gone way beyond our control. One is the word art, and the other one is the word curator, because <laughs> now <laughs> we feel very oppressed because everyone's curating everything uh, from their breakfast all the way up to uh, their wardrobe, <laughs> and then they curate their experiences, Curating and dinners. then they come to... So, so you feel utterly useless as a curator, and then uh, everything is art now, you know, absolutely everything. So I, being a kind of, you know, old-fashioned, uh, bigot, uh, bigoted museum curator. I feel that we have to, we do have to lay down some uh, parameters, and and I think it is useful for everybody if you actually have some sense of, um, you know, what qualifies as what. Um, otherwise, I'm going to start calling myself a keeper of art, which is what they used to say in. Um, in England, and I'm quite confident no one's going to steal that word away because nobody wants to be a keeper. <laughs> yeah. But I think that conversation is what keeps civilization going. I don't want it. To, I don't want it to be just boop, that, beep, that. You know what? What we're we going to talk about up here? So, um, this is mostly for you to throw out there for you guys to comment on. But what you've been speaking about brought it to mind. Um, I will admit that I quite recently found myself at Southern Methodist University where the George W. Bush Library is. And I was actually there to go to the Zubaran exhibition at the Meadows Museum, but a fellow, a, another curator told me, oh, you must go to the Bush Library. And I had never been to a presidential library, so even though I wasn't a Bush fan, I said, okay, I'll go. And um, in the lobby, uh, they've installed cases in the wall very beautifully, very professionally, and they are filled with the diplomatic gifts that came to the Bush family as well as his cabinet um, over the years, which of course no one's really allowed to accept personally, which becomes a possession of the people of the United States of America. And some of these gifts, you know, I've always heard about diplomatic gifts, and I know about the his history of diplomatic gifts, but contemporary diplomatic gifts, you don't really 
maybe you'll see a, a picture of somebody being presented with something, but I was astounded at, I mean, there were these bejeweled um, stirrups, gold stirrups, you know, from Syria, or, you know, I, I can't recall, and, and there was a lot of jewelry. And, um, but what, as a former museum person, struck me was that there was no reference to who made these objects. There was no reference to design. There was no reference to the materials. There were none of the standard information you would expect to approach them as design objects or as jewelry was present. It was just who gave it, the date it was given, and who it was given to. Um, so I guess the, the question there is where um, jewelry lives completely outside of everything you're talking about. Does anybody? Then maybe it's, I don't know, you put it in a case. Does that make it art or is it just booty? <laughs> you know, it's presidential booty. It's treasure. But it's in a case, so we're looking at it, we're presented to it, we're presented it as an object to be adored or looked at, so. Venerated. Venerated. I want those. Yes. Yeah. It also sounds like it was about the occasion, the donor to the recipient. We're also used to being in museums where labels give us, you know, just the kind of information you're talking about. But I'm thinking maybe whoever created this thought it was more important as a gift than as a, an object. But because it's nation to nation, perhaps that anim an anonymity was important in that con case. Whereas I thought differently, I really wanted to know, to look at some of this stuff, you knew it was very beautifully crafted and well made, and I would have loved to have learned that this was the work of this great craftsman. So and often, you know, that, that's something that actually sort of haunts jewelry is the anonymous maker. Yeah. Uh, you realize that every piece of jewelry with a great house name on it was made by lots of people, often more than one person, the gem setter, the engraver, the, the, the metal worker. And most great houses go to extreme lengths to keep those names hidden forever. And uh, I've written about it for Metalsmith Magazine because they're, uh, and when you can get into the archives of a company, sometimes you can find out who the actual makers were. Uh, but that's never the intent of the maker. So uh, for a gift like those golden spurs or anything like that, when you, give, when you give someone, I was just reading about this on Facebook this morning, there was this great diamond tiara given to Mae Gallette, who was a New York socialite who became the Duchess of Roxborough. And there was this great diamond necklace tiara no mention of who made it, but a mention of who gave it to her. Uh, and that really becomes the thing is, what matters in the case of a, of a historical context, especially that a diplomatic gift, is the giver, not the maker. And the giver may know the maker, but the recipient is embarrassed to ask or doesn't care. It's all about who gave it to me because I'm important not, oh, I'm so curious, who did the gem setting on those gold spurs, I mean gold uh, stirrups? And that probably never crossed his mind, frankly, because you'd have to be a curator to care. But it's the idea that it was the, it was the giver who mattered in that transaction, and that's what's recorded. Uh, but also the awkwardness, if they don't tell you, you don't want to nag them for, oh, where was this made? What carat gold is that? You know, you don't really want to go into that. But to your point, you know, there are New York City designers, and you do want to know that that is by, oh, that's Ted Mewling, I love his, Earrings, you know, he's he does have people working for him as well, but you know, it's Ted. He started out as Ted. It's his design. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas maybe things that include larger crafts, larger workshops, it's you know, you don't, well, you I, can't. And and for example, there was a great, and I totally blanked on his name, who is Indian, who was the great designer for Harry Winston from the 40s to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and nobody who bought Harry Winston necklaces knew who he was. But in the jewelry world, he is revered as one of these. And, and you remember Rima Kishwani wrote a book about him. Yeah, yeah. Right. There, there's been a book about him, but which of course I can't remember. So, uh, but so I think I think that that's what there is a certain. I think one of the the roles of the artist jeweler is to identify themselves with their work, and to 
brand themselves, which is another hideous word like curate uh, that has become <laughs> rife even in museums. Um, but but so there, there's always a name associated with the jewel, but that name changes depending on the context of the jewel's existence. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, on the subject of diplomatic gifts, if you look at um, the Islamic world, the exchange between kings and courts was very much a jeweled exchange. And you have great records of jeweled items that were traveling across the world. And, and, but of course, these were now being sent in a very personalized way from one king to another. I feel that now with states kind of exchanging gifts, the quality of gifts or the types of gifts have probably taken a dramatically different turn. And uh, you don't have that sort of sense of really trying to impress. In fact, you pr know that it's not going to go into the hands of the person itself, themselves. So I feel that there might even be a sort of, you know, well, we won't send the best, absolute best pashmina shawl from Kashmir. We'll send, you know, something that looks good enough to be put in a case and on display and so on. So I, I think there's been a little shift there. Um, I was telling my colleagues yesterday about these very amusing debates on the Saatchi and Saatchi website. They have these um, gallery debates. And your question made me think of the one that I mentioned yesterday where they debated um, who explains art the best. And, you know, and they had a museum representative, they had a scholarly representative, they had a maker, a bit like us, and then they also had somebody who won the debate who was a priest from, <laughs> from a church, yeah. And he won the debate because he said, he just very straightforwardly explained what was going on visually in the art without any uh, struggle to contextualize in history or style or date and materials and all of that was secondary to serve the main purpose of the piece which was to show a man on a cross crucified and what was it about and what was the message. And it was interesting because it did make you think about experiencing objects in completely different contexts uh, other than our usual context and then who is the most successful when you're out there in that kind of a, a playing field. So that's a very amusing debate. Uh, you can catch it online. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll just end this on the note that Navina brought up is that the curators, museums were tagged as the people who were the worst at explaining art. So <laughs> ponder that as you look through the show today. Thank you.